The Fed has done several pivots this year, and I think they've got one more pivot left. At least they're kind of hinting that way, and there's a reason to believe that is. A lot of people are expecting a pivot. They're expecting a dovish Fed pivot. However, history and the surprises so far this year have shown that all the Fed pivots thus far have been, in fact, hawkish. And they tend to not like to surprise us with some tremendous massive pivot. It seems that many are hoping that the Fed is going to surprise us with some massive pivot. But if you look back over the past several years, when we were approaching tightening, the Fed had several meetings where it discussed talking about, talking about tightening. That notion that we are going to give you plenty and plenty and plenty of time to prepare for us to begin hiking rates and having less easy monetary policy. At the end of last year, the Fed expected to only hike one time this year, and I believe it was either a 25 or a 50 basis point hike. Clearly, that did not end up being the case. At one point, it was common knowledge that the Fed was not gonna do 75 basis points that that was some sort of extreme rate hike. But now we've seen four 75 basis point hikes in a row. Loretta Mester and Mary Daly talked today, two female Fed presidents. And let's break down these comments so we can make sure we're getting the clearest picture. Mary Daly, in my opinion, probably the second most dovish member we need to consider. Kashkari probably used to have second place. But now it's Mary Daly, president of the San Francisco board, only behind Brainerd, Joe Biden, direct appointee. Last week, Bullard talked about this notion of 5 to 7% interest rates, depending on where the economy goes, what happens, 5%. Daly, dovish member, she's talking 5%. Mester, my opinion, a little bit more on the hawkish side, but not the most hawkish, most likely, pretty pretty level head. I believe she also talks tomorrow before Bullard. She's saying not rate hikes not done, but we can slow down to 50 basis point hikes because we had to go. And this is, this is an important thing to know. We had to go at an accelerated rate to enter restrictive territory without being in restrictive territory. There's no way inflation can get down to 2% because they're not being restrictive. Now, we are just entering restrictive territory. We're very moderately restrictive. However, inflation is very high. There's supply chain issues. There's labor issues. This is a serious matter that has powerful forces at play. We're going to have to get more restrictive. She didn't necessarily say where that was. She said the Fed still has more work to do. She said the Fed still has more hikes to do, that we can slow down from 75 the market right now appears to be priced and appears to be acting as if the Fed is going to do a 50 and a 25 or a 50 and a 50. Seems like we're definitely going to get 50 at the next meeting. Uh, the Fed is not indicating any sort of dovish tone here. They're saying they're not even thinking about pausing. So that entire notion, that entire thought that a lot of people seem to have that's allowed the 10-year to be at one point this morning below 3.8%. Last week, I believe it was even below 3.7%. Uh, that, that's allowing the 10-year to get there because... They're expecting a pause in the near future. We have to uh, realize that nowhere in the Fed's rhetoric is this the case. They're not going to see this CPI. They're not going to see the December CPI and then move. December CPI, it's not going to be 3%, okay? They need to go from 7 to about 3% to really start to kind of get dovish. Holding rates at a high level is not a dovish outcome, in my opinion. I don't think the market rallies on that. I guess we can hypothesize what the market might rally on in a second, what can really put that bottom in. But we're just so far from that. There's so many things that can happen. And all we've talked about right here are rates. We haven't even talked about inflation. We haven't even talked about a possible recession. These are other important factors. Tomorrow, Bullard talks. We're not going to have a video, unfortunately. I'm going to be on a flight heading back to New York for Thanksgiving. This is probably going to be the only video of the week, so I'm going to try and pack a lot in here. Bullard's talking tomorrow. That is a very important talk to listen to. I suggest you do that because that's the hawkish end. That's Bullard talking tomorrow 
might give the Fed a little bit more flexibility. It might move the goalpost a little bit and might be that pivot that we're looking for, but might end up being on the hawkish side because the dovish members are giving us what the market is priced for. And I don't think the most dovish possible outcome we can experience right now is what's going to happen. That's not the way the Fed's talking. We haven't made any progress on inflation. Like really, we haven't. We haven't, okay? Get this, understand this. Yes, inflation came below very high expectations, but it was still 0.4% month on month, which is 4.8% annualized. And that is 0.4% higher than it was in July when we had 0.0% month on month inflation. And guess what? We went up from that. So don't, like the Fed says, don't look too much at any one data point. Yes, the last one was, I guess, kind of good in some regards, but still too early. We have to acknowledge that. We also have to listen to what OPEC's saying today about possible production cuts. Atlanta Fed is forecasting 4% GDP. It's not like the economy is tipping over tremendously and deflation is about to occur. It's uh, still a strong economic picture. And when you have a strong economy, you don't need low rates. Low rates are for a weak economy that needs stimulus that needs people to be confident enough to go out, borrow money, spend it, pay interest on it, lower interest to incentivize them to do so and inject velocity of money into the economy. That's not the environment we're in. The Fed is still talking about demand and supply being imbalanced. They're trying to have the opposite effect. They're trying to have less people spend. This, in my opinion, is not a good thing for the economy for stocks. Yes, companies are doing fine so far in the past in forward look, forward look, back, backward looking information, which I don't like the term of, it's information. But uh, there is a particular name who I am afraid might damage an app I have been working on very much if I talk negatively about them. We'll see what kind of tricks they play. But we're gonna talk about them because we're here right now talking about the market and Apple is a 7% weight in the S&P 500 that over the past several weeks has barely moved. However, we've gotten a couple very crucial pieces of information. iPhone demand is now, iPhone 14 demand is now not being fulfilled until after Christmas. Why? Because there's tremendous demand. Well, allegedly there's pretty solid demand but unfortunately, there's no supply. Again, Fed thing, more importantly, hindering their earnings, more importantly, affecting their PE ratio, more, infor- more importantly, expecting the price to come down to reflect the fundamentals that are occurring in that company. People were justifying a very high price for Apple. We're justifying outperformance of Apple by virtually every other comparable company in the market because iPhone 14s, we're supposed to have this rich person demand. The the wealthy consumer in this environment, us stock traders, us wealthy individuals, we have nothing to worry about because we're wealthy. Well, guess what? You do have something to worry about because now Apple's not gonna have your iPhone. So the lower price consumer is taking a hit. That's being seen across the board, has been seen for a while now. High price consumer, not able to provide Apple with that cash that they once were, or at least less demand for the product because now you got this pain of a wait time. Probably some impact on Apple earnings is my assumption. Then you get back to the longer term trend, which is in place in 2019, wasn't uh, skewed through this coronavirus pandemic where people were at home needing new technology products. Longer upgrade cycles, decreasing popular, or slower birth rates, You get the idea here. You might have a little bit of an expensive stock, something that is priced for perfection in an environment where it looks like imperfection might not be occurring. I mean, they're not able to sell every iPhone that they want because they don't have every iPhone that they want. They want the 14 Pros, they can't sell the 14 Pros. That's gonna limit earnings. If you have heard past commentary on Apple, on this channel after the last earnings call, you might remember that we didn't hear many many specifics on what was going down forward looking in Apple earnings. At least that was my read. Maybe somebody's got a better read. If you do, 
leave it in the comments. Feel free to correct me. I would love that additional information. It's my lifeblood. It's the oil that keeps this engine going. Is that, is that information? Anyways, we're short the stock, full disclosure. We think it is outperforming peers, but is not necessarily justified to do so. Um, it should be like the rest of everything, you know? I don't think anybody is expecting much uh, a particular discretion here. It's, I mean, obviously there's some discretion that occurs in the economy, but we printed money before and now we're sucking money out and incomes are going down a little bit with people getting laid off. The amount of money is coming down a little bit and people got the same needs. Yes, I get it, Apple's a need. Maybe something like Six Flags is gonna take a little bit of a disproportionate impact, but with comps of Apple, very large companies. We're talking Google and Microsoft. Google, I get it, has ad business. Big nuance, Apple's holding up very strongly, my opinion, very, very strongly, disproportionately so, and I've outlined the reasons why I think that's the case. That is a 7% stock in the market, you know, a, uh, a cut in that to, you know, a more peer average type of move. I mean, I believe it's only down 8% the last year. That's tremendous. Uh, would be a sizable chunk, a noticeable chunk out of the S&P 500, particularly the impact it will then have on other companies. It's not just Apple. It's not like every other stock's going to be flat and Apple's going to move, right? So this is how we're viewing things going on the Thanksgiving weekend. I think the Fed is teeing up hawkish talk tomorrow with Mester and Bullard. I think this is a coordinated attack. You're going dovish, medium today, then tomorrow, medium, hawkish. I think that indicates hawkish Fed. Conspiracy theory, I know, I've got plenty of those. The haters gonna hate, but that's today's video. And until next time, peace out.